Dr. Eric Meslin, well, actually wasn't commissioned by him. He was commissioned by other folks and he will tell you all about it. But Dr. Eric Meslin is the president and the CEO of the CCA. He commissioned the rest of us <laughs> to be involved in this. Uh, I had the pleasure of working on it uh, with some of my colleagues who were here over the last 18 months under the fearless leadership of Dr. Brett Finley, who really knows how to run a meeting, I will tell you that. And uh, we're gonna hear uh, from them and from some, uh, from some other colleagues now, but I wanna introduce Eric first to come up and tell you a little bit about how the, uh, the report was uh, brought to life. Thank you. Thanks very much. Jerry, thanks very much, and, uh, and thanks to the Gardner Foundation, uh, uh, Janet, your leadership and, uh, and creativity is uh, appreciated. You've also been a great friend and supporter of the CCA, so we're, we're grateful for your support. And um, McMaster, thank you for hosting us, um, especially the, uh, the DeGroote Institute. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment for the CCA. Um, we like to do work, get it out into, the, uh, out into the public, and then sort of step away and let others rip it up, play with it, uh, and the like. But we're also rather uh, selfish. We'd like to see the work actually get used. So you're part of a, uh, hopefully with your informed consent by being here, uh, a bit of an experiment in knowledge mobilization. You're gonna see a, a discussion about some of the work. Uh, Dame Sally has already described a little bit of it. Uh, but I just wanna sort of put into very brief context, because you came to hear others and not me, that. The CCA is an organization that's been around for 15 years. Our job is to carry out assessments of the evidence on, uh, on really compelling social uh, topics. And the range is quite large, everything from medical assistance in dying to fracking, uh, to uh, medicines for children, uh, to marine shipping. Uh, it's an organization that is quite horizontal in its mission. And it has sort of one value proposition, and that's to carry out independent assessments of evidence that is, are requested of us, principally by a federal sponsor. In the case of the CCA report that you're gonna hear from uh, in a moment, it was requested of us or referred uh, by, uh, I can now say former, uh, Minister of Science and Sport, Kirsty Duncan. I say former because Parliament is not in session and we'll wait till November the 20th to find out if there's going to be uh, another Minister of Science or whether uh, Minister Duncan will be in that portfolio. I do want to do a little bit of a shout out to her, however, because you have already seen or uh, understood that this particular report has maybe an odd title, Socioeconomic Impacts. You should know that this topic, as uh, Dame Sally alluded to, has been on lots of countries' agendas for many, many years. Indeed, it was on the CCA agenda as long ago as 2012, when it sort of lay there on the back burner of possible topics, largely, I suspect, because no one was quite sure what to ask us. I mean, we respond to a question that's asked. We don't go lobbying for topics that we would like to take on. I suspect that what happened is in the early to mid-2000s, the idea of AMR was a topic that someone should ask someone about it. Well, what's the state of knowledge on AMR? Well, that never came to the front burner. It came to the front burner um, in late 2016, 2017, uh, when I think through a creative and inspired uh, moment of opportunity, uh, the Minister of Science asked us to undertake a uh, an assessment that looked at socioeconomic impact. Why did she do that? Well, I suspect that she did it because this became a whole of government problem. If you name it, as a science problem, then it falls within the Westminster system into the great big deep dark silo of science or health. This affects the entire cabinet table. So when I say this both to you and to the, I think 130 people who are watching this on live stream, um, you are seeing uh, work in action. You are seeing the evidence that CCA has accumulated. Uh, you are seeing the work uh, that a group of committed volunteers undertake uh, on behalf of Canada and I think on, on behalf of the world. We released this report two days ago, as of about two hours ago. Um, Heather uh, Ennis, our Director of Communications, let me know that we have had uh, 1,045 downloads of the report in English and French. That sets almost a new record for CCA, depending on how you count 
uh, our downloads when we released our big assessment on medical assistance in dying. We had quite an uptick when we released our assessment on climate change risk, quite a large uptick. You can download them for free right now in English and French. We'd love you to do that. Um, there are another couple of hundred one-pagers uh, that have been downloaded. So we want people to, uh, to read the work. So enough of uh, me describing what I'm going to actually turn it over to, to the real expert, and that's Dr. Brett Finley. Um, I could spend hours um, reading Brett Finley's uh, biography to you. In fact, I think I should do that now and, uh, and just not let him uh, speak. Um, uh, Brett is a national treasure in Canada, and I would dare say he's probably an international treasure for those who have worked with him and know him. Um, he is um, the UBC Peter Wall Distinguished Professor and Professor in the Michael Smith Lab um, uh, of Microbiology, Immunology, and Biochemistry. He's co-director and senior fellow of the Humans in Microbes program of CIFAR, uh, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and author of two books um, with probably the best titles in the world. The first one of his, uh, Let Them Eat Dirt, Saving Your Child from an Over-Sanitized World. And you probably don't need to know more about the content of the book that I would encourage you to read it. I get no um, uh, uh, any kind of gratuity for that, but it's a spectacular description. And he's done all of the usual uh, ARC score metrics of hundreds and hundreds of journal articles. But from the CCA perspective, it was alluded to by Jerry, uh, Brett not only runs a mean meeting, and uh, our project director, Dr. Anita Melnick, is here and probably can attest to that more than, than anyone, but when CCA brings expert panels together, uh, it's not just getting a bunch of smart people in the room, because we have the smartest people in every room. Uh, they like to come. It's an honor to participate. We're always delighted that they're willing to do this. But it takes a special kind of sauce that a chair can bring together diverse perspectives, can get people on time, on budget to the end uh, with a report that happens to have come out um, right about the time of uh, International Biotics Awareness Week. Uh, the Canadian Science Policy uh, Conference met yesterday. Uh, so lots of things going on. And with, uh, without further ado, I just want to thank uh, Brett for all of his leadership and let him explain the report to you. Brett. Thank you, Eric, Janet, Gardner, everyone here. So my job in the next 20 minutes or so is to tell you what we've done. And so let's see, we got this. So this is the title of the, um, of the thing. I like the slide, actually. You see a bunch of people looking at their cell phones. You know the person checks their cell phones 47 times a day, and on that cell phone there's 10 times more microbes than on a toilet seat. So anyway, <laughs> with that, you can tell where I come from. So this, this is what the report was commissioned. It was commissioned by the Minister of Science to the Public Health Agency of Canada. And really, it's to get a real handle on this. And as Eric alluded to, this was a, a quite an interesting topic. And I remember the first meeting, we sort of looked at each other and said, what are we going to do? You know, like, how, how do we do this? As Eric said, we had a wonderfully um, group of smart people, all sorts of areas. And I'll, I'll talk. So there was 13 of us. Um, and there's one in the second from the right, or from the right-hand side there. You may recognize that one. Actually, that one guy, he just, he just said one thing all the time, more money for research, more money for research, more money for research. So. Actually, Jerry had a huge amount to do with this, and really he and I was sort of the bastion of the research end of this whole thing. So there's epidemiologists, infectious diseases doctors, there's sociologists, there's modelers, there's agricultural experts in there. And what was really neat is everyone just brought their own expertise to the table. No one had any agendas to, to bring forward, and it was really a wonderful group. We met five times over the span of two years, and um, it, was, it was a really terrific group to work with, and, and I think a terrific product out of it. So as, alluding, as Sally alluded to, One Health, it's kind of a weird term, um, but antimicrobial resistance is a complex, complex problem. And it doesn't just involve the healthcare system or the agriculture system or even fishing. It involves all these things. And very soon on, we started looking at this, we realized we had to do this, that the task was not really to focus, well, um, just on healthcare, it was to focus on all these things. So we sort of wanted to take a holistic view to this whole thing. And again, as Sally has alluded to, it's not just Canada. This is a world problem. And it's, as you know, the world is all interconnected, and things are coming and going, and people are coming and going all around the world. And you kind of have to take this real holistic view to this whole thing. How does it affect tourism, for example? You know, if you're going to some place, you might get a multi-resistant infection. How does that impact dollars and health? So we sort of embraced the challenge and sort of um, knuckled up and really started to um, um, try and figure things out. So listed up here is, is kind of the things we focused on. 
Um, I think one of the really neat things the report did is instead of focusing on a, on a bug parade, you know, carbenicillin resistant E. coli, XX, it, MRSA, whatever, we focused on clinical syndromes. So we picked 10 of these things, such as urinary tract infections, soft tissue infections, clinical syndromes. And sometimes more than one microbe causes these things, that's okay. And we looked at them in syndromes. This was, I think, a unique feature to this report to do this. So as Eric alluded to, there's two major areas. One is the social impacts and the other is the economic impacts. In some senses, the economic impacts are easier because it's putting dollars on things, but in some senses, it's, it's harder too because you're modeling. And when you do these future models, you tweak it a little bit now, it goes like this by the time you're out 30 years. And that was, that was quite a challenge. So within the economic impacts, let's look at the impact on, on healthcare systems. What's it going to do to hospital expenses and things? And then if you're sick or you die, you obviously don't contribute to the economy. What's the effect on the whole Canadian economy? And frankly, this is the area I think that scared me the most. The numbers are just, just literally exponential. I, mean, I didn't expect to see that. Also affecting the agricultural system. So this is not directly you know, the effects on AMR and animals themselves, but if you have, a, say, a country that's using antibiotics in livestock and you can't then import from them or you can't export um, because of bans type things. Social impacts really put the personal face on this thing. We've heard about this in broad numbers, and I can you know, say all these amazing numbers, but when you take individual stories, what is it going to mean to you? Pretty much I think most people in this audience are going to be here 30 years from now. That's what we're talking about. What is it going to mean to you? When you need a hip replacement or a knee replacement, uh, I might get an infection, and if I get an infection, I'm going to die because we can't treat it anymore. And the analogy I like to use is think of SARS and what that did to Toronto. People didn't go outside anymore. They didn't go to restaurants. Conferences were closed. People were kind of leery of shaking each other's hands or hugging each other kind of thing. So these are the kind of qualitative things the sociologists were exploring in there. And it, we've interspersed in the report is some slightly lighter reading about um, case studies and individuals and how it's impacting them and what it really means. Another thing that comes through really clear is it's not even across all social classes, of course. Um, there's definite disparities there. So we looked at all these things and really tried to, to work our way through these. So we do have a problem. It's here. It's not a coming problem. This is our problem today. And, you know, there's 14,000 people that die of infections. Of those, 5,700 a year in Canada um, die of AMR infections that we just couldn't treat. What does 5,700 mean? Well, that's more people than die in the opioid crisis, which we call a crisis. We don't call AMR a crisis. That's approaching the numbers of Alzheimer's in our society deaths which everyone hears about all the time. So it's here, it's now, and, and, and really we're, we're looking at it. So these are the kind of numbers we're talking about. We, we model different predictions. We're at 26% of inf AMR infection rates today. That's our levels of what we're in Canada, and Sally showed that slide of other countries. We're about average for G7, which is around, I think, 30%. Um, Scandinavian countries are around 10%, and you saw the others off the charts there. So what's going to happen in 30 years? Well, everything points to if we don't do anything, it's going to creep upwards. It's been creeping upwards for now. We'll get to about 40%. So we modeled 26%, today's rate. We modeled 40% where we think it's going to get to. And just for an ex exercise in futility, we modeled 100%. It's not going to 100%. Scientifically, we'll never get there. But we just did that for the fun of it. So you can see the numbers by 2050. By 2050, one in four deaths will actually be due to an antimicrobial resistant infection. One in four. We're at one in 19 today. And so this is coming, and it is coming hard. So these are the three areas. I'll just quickly gloss over these and give you some of the things we're finding in these three areas. So first of all, impacts on health. Here's the numbers I showed you here, 5,400. That's going to go up to 13,700 people a year in Canada. We've got a 40% in 30 years. Big numbers. Um, dollars, this is where it gets expensive. You know, $1.4 billion a year um, currently. This year, that's what we spent due to this problem. If we didn't have this problem, we'd save $1.4 billion, and you see the numbers going to almost $8 billion by 2050. And, and, and. So here's the three different levels, um, 26, 40, and 100% impact on healthcare spending. This is one of the graphs in, in, the, in there. It, it increases, obviously, and goes up and up as the years go on because it just compounds itself and gets worse. Um, economy. So this is lost days work, you're off sick, can't be treated sort of thing, so you're stuck in the hospital or you die and so you then obviously can't contribute to the economy. So you do all these numbers, you do all these interesting modeling, modeling experiments and looking at all these different parameters, so you figure about two billion a year now in Canada is being caused to this and we're gonna go up to 21 billion a year due to lost in, in the GDP in the economy. 
And you can see these numbers, and the red, of course, is 100%. We're not going there, but we think we're going to where the green one is. You can see this is going to have a very significant impact on the Canadian economy. So this is where it gets a little more personal, the social kind of things. You know, how does it affect these things? And like I said, as I already alluded to, think of the SARS outbreak as, a, as an example of how this affects everyone. And, you know, you, you, it affects your quality of life, trust, you know, someone's coughing in the room. Do you really want to be in that room? You know, kind of thing. Um, even travel and tourism. Um, you know, if someone goes to a country where there's high resistant rates, they get an accident, treated, they bring back one of these multi-resistant organisms, they can then spread throughout the hospital system. We've seen this happen, and people die due to this. And on the right is obviously the, the, the increase in all these other issues that, that accompany this really stigma of AMR that goes with society. And it, 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 it's not pretty when you look at these things. It's human nature, and it's expected, but um, we were able to look at that. So what do we do? Is the sky completely falling? Are we done? You know, if climate change doesn't get us, this will. No, we're not there. I think that the, what we want to do is say, look, here's where we are now. But it's not hopeless. And really, these are, Sally already alluded to these things. This is what we can do. First of all, we need to cherish antibiotics. That's the stewardship. Only use them as necessary. If it's a viral infection, antibacterials probably aren't necessary for that. Watch and wait, for example. Um, surveillance. We need to do more of this. We need to know when each particular EMR has hit us and where it's come from, what it's doing, follow its spread, contain it, clean it up type things. So that, that's the, the stewardship, the infection, infection prevention control. It took about one and a half meetings to figure out what IPC was. I had all sorts of acronyms, but oh yeah, there, infection. Yeah, it's, there's all these crazy acronyms because I don't live in this world. But really that's the mass and the hand washing stations in the hospital, the scrubbing down of the wards when you have this, the containment type things, um, which you need to do when you have these things. And then Jerry, my favorite area is of course research and innovation. Um, you know, antibiotics, as Sally alluded to, there aren't many, if any, coming down the pipes. What are we going to do as this resistance increase? I think there's examples out there. Um, fecal transfers post C. diff, my favorite subject. Um, you know, that, that actually works. And here's one that, that's an antibiotic cause disease you have to cure um, by an, another way. And there's many other creative ways, as well as hopefully different ways of making antibiotics. And no, any one of these is going to solve the problem. This is going to be a concerted effort using all four of these types of things to working together to really um, try and do it. Just to give you some examples of hope, though, too, is that, um, you know, in the Netherlands, you saw there, there in the Nordic countries, they're down around 10%. They work hard at these things. They spend a lot of money in these things, and I think the results show for that. 10% is a much more manageable number than 40% in terms of um, the, the effects on society. In a lovely Made in BC story that I've been heavily involved in, last 10 years, we've been really pushing the decrease of antibiotic use, and it's been really successful in ages 0 to 1 of age of kids. Um, we've got it down from about 70% getting a course of antibiotics down to around 40%. So dropped it in half. Well, one of the things our work has shown is early life microbes um, are affected by antibiotics, which affects asthma later in life. So well, there's been a decrease in, in um, antibiotic use in kids. And if our theory is true, five years later, there should be a decrease in asthma in kids in BC. It's exactly there. It's beautiful. We've showed the microbes, and this is just coming out, just accepted today, actually. It's coming out, and it's a beautiful story on prudent antibiotic use, 1.4 million people, it, it's gorgeous data, it works. We just decrease using it, and this is just through stewardship. So the sky is not totally fallen yet, there is hope, um, but we got to do it. So yes, it's complex, it's global, every country's got to do it. So, um, Sally and I were just saying that why don't we run the UK numbers through these things, we've got the model now, everyone can run these things through this and you know, get these numbers for each country and really show what we're dealing with in terms of the numbers. So to sort of sum this thing up, um, it, it's a massive read. I think Sally and I are probably the only ones that have read it recently. <laughs> it's 300 and odd whatever pages. I too read it on the plane again, just to make sure I know it. I think I've got it down to about three hours now because I know it better, but, but there's a lot in there and it's good stuff and it really sort of shows you. And we didn't want to be um, hyperbolic about this. We didn't want to you know, scream, oh, the world is dying sort of thing. We just wanted to be accurate. What do we know based on science? And that's what we came up with. So it really is a threat globally, as, as we've heard. Um, it's complex, involves both health, agriculture, society, all these different you know, swirling issues around, and no one of them is going to actually solve it. And um, there's, it's, it is a global problem. What one country does impacts what other countries do. And I, I, I highlight the last point really significantly. We are told repeatedly at 
every five minutes that CC me, do not make recommendations. You can't make recommendations. I'm not making a recommendation, but Jesus, we got to do something quick. Because <laughs> I think, you know, just seeing these, these really puts in place. So I, I, I will leave you on this kind of concept. If you add the stuff up, what we're dealing with, this is where it gets really, really amazing. So over the next 30 years, if we go to 40%, which we think we do based on our best estimate, we're talking about 400,000 Canadians losing their lives due to an infection that they should be able to treat with antibiotics. 400,000 people. Hospital costs, $120 billion. What can you do in a hospital for $120 billion? My guess is a heck of a lot. And that's just money that's wasted because we can't, you know, we're, we're struggling with these things. And then if you want to talk GDP, economy and stuff, you're talking about $400 billion. Phenomenal amounts of dollars that we are paying to basically suffer through this problem. So what we're hoping this report does is lay it out. Here's the problem. We really believe, based on sound data, that this is where we stand. And then based on that, I really encourage all of this country to really, okay, what are we going to do now based on this? What can we do, and how do we move this along? So with that, I want to say thank you, first of all, to the panel members. Jerry's here, Joanne's here, um, for all their contribution. The CCA staff, they were incredible. Anita, um, Heather, um, even Eric. Um, um, the, I mean, yeah, we get credit for the port, but these guys did all the hard work. You know, they were looking up the references, they were helping write it, and, and they were terrific in that sense. And then, of course, the sponsors for this. So that's terrific. We have four minutes that we can take questions before, and I'll keep us on time. So with that, thank you very much, and I think we can just do a few questions before we go into the panel discussion. Thanks. Over there. Uh, Monica, right? Yeah. Hang on, let's use the microphone because it's being webcast and they need to hear it, so that's why we do the mic. Thank you. Keith McGlone. I've been involved in healthcare acquired infections at the hospital level for quite a few years, and we've been talking about some of these numbers for a long time. And I've personally had hospital CFOs tell me that all of these costs that you mentioned, which I agree with, are not really valid to the hospital because they're costs that are not really seen, because when they avoid an infection, they don't get to, cre to get credit for a dollar savings, and they also don't see any savings. So is this another report that's gonna hit the dust shelf or not? Um, well, you know, Sally was talking about incentive programs and things. I, I think there ought to be incentives for decreasing antibiotic use. Um, I mean, yes, the particular hospital might have their budget, but overall we're talking dollars and, um, I guess I'm really hoping that, that PHAC and others can use this as ammunition and say, look, we've got to change things. And not just a punitive, punitive say, well, you're fine if you use these antibiotics. Let's give them bonuses. If you decrease some, you can, the money saved there will give you extra money for, for other programs and things. It's a complex solution, I agree. And you're right, it's been around for a while. I, I, I don't think it's been realized of this magnitude, frankly, until now. And I think this will hopefully drive it home that, look, we, we do need programs that make this work. Okay, make it quick, and then we'll, we'll go up there. Okay, so Monica, way up there. So what aspects of what came through this are the, the uniquely Canadian aspects within the report? So, so what makes this, aside from the different approach of the 10 syndromes and so on, what, what part of this story is you know, customized to Canada and might be a very different story if it were. Well, we finished every sentence with A. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the syndromes, I, I would not downplay that. I think that's, that's a very significant concept that gives us a different way of thinking instead of bug parade. I think that was a, a really brilliant move on the panel's part to classify it that way instead of, because we actually looked at the antimicrobial levels and it was really spotty and patchy type thing. I think that the social aspects of it, rarely do you see those kind of personal reports and how it's going to affect the individual socially was, it was another nice way in addressing First Nations issues in there and other um, social inequities in there. That's not usually done. Usually it's a bang by the numbers kind of X, X, Y kind of thing. So I think incorporating that was really neat too. And I think more of the whole holistic putting it all together. Um, the modeling for me was quite an interest, you know, how do you predict how many tourists are going to be affected and, you know, how many pounds of meat coming from somewhere will be affected. That, that was really neat, but I think others have done that type of thing too. So I would say those are the, 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 the Canadian features. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, 
I'm curious about the dissemination to the general public, though, because we, we know the academics get it. We know that the doctors are, are starting to understand it and not, not push it. But there is still this sense to the general public that if they don't get it, they're somehow being stigmatized or they, they're not able to get it or it'll always be the lower socioeconomic status who don't get access to medication, whereas the people living up on the mountain will get it or whatever it might be. So is, is there a plan to disseminate this mm -hmm. in a way that might hit? I think we've already begun that. The press interest has been phenomenal. I mean, I lost track of how many double, if not triple digit interviews we've done in the last days between everyone. And the thing is, having the personal stories and things, I think that's appealing to people. If I get up and say, you know, $300 billion GDP, everyone falls asleep, you know, you're not going to make that. Um, but if you start, you know, having these personal stories and you start saying, if I say one in four people are going to die due to this in 30 years, you know, you look around, okay, you, 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 then I'm fourth. Like, the numbers get pretty scary. And I think people start to realize this gets personal and affects them. And I think that's the story that's going, that people are really latching on to um, about this whole thing. And, and you know, I think I, I, I often say this is very much like climate change. It is coming. It is going to impact every single one of us unless we do something now about this. And it's going to be similar magnitude, too, if not more so, because you can see this actually happening more than, say, climate change right now. So I think it's the, those kind of appeals. And any of you that are talking to people, um, you know, don't cite the numbers, cite the stories. You know, say, look, you know, oh, so you had an, you know, you had an infection. You know, did, was, did it work? You know, you know, one in four chance that's not going to work next time because of this kind of thing. And we can all spend that, send that message. Okay, I think in efforts to stay on time, the plan is we're going to have four panel members come up and say their unscripted and unedited thoughts. We're at their mercy. I'm not sure what they think of this thing. So the first one I'm going to um, call up is Kevin Utterson. Um, is that right, Utterson? Utterson, okay. He's outed me. Um, um, so he's the executive director of combating antibiotic-resistant bacterial biopharmaceutical accelerator at Carbax. He's a professor at Boston University where he teaches health and corporate law and his research focuses on the organization and the finance of the health sector, uh, and he specializes in global pharmaceutical markets, antibiotics, and other antimicrobials that can, that can degrade in uselessness over time through resistance. Kevin. Want me to do it from here? Yes, please. Uh, okay, all right, all right. So thank you for that uh, introduction, and uh, Really happy to be here, even though there's uh, snow in the ground. Uh, a lot of my family's in the Midwest, and uh, we, we know what happens. We know what happens. Uh, this report, um, I want to say first that being in Canada, it's built uh, on a solid foundation. You know, really some of the work that's been done previously in Canada, uh, I think back uh, to the parliamentary, uh, the parliamentary report, the Standing uh, Committee on Health in 2018 that Bill Casey was the chair of. Uh, it was actually, you know, a good report, and before that, uh, Michael Gardner's team uh, did a threat assessment in 2015, and uh, I have to say that amongst the people that read threat assessment reports, and I'm one of those people, uh, that report of 2015 out of Canada stands out as it was the best methodology of any of them, uh, even better, I thought, than the methodology used by the CDC uh, in, in 2013. So there's a really solid foundation for this report. Canada has been thoughtful in the way that you've approached this. And you've already heard several ways in which uh, Canada, again, uh, the CCA uh, through this process has done a great job. Um, I want to say just a, a couple of statistics in here and, and compare them a little bit because one of the very clever things you did was to, to beat the CDC's report out by, you know, by a day and a half or whatever it was. You know, once again, Canada's the winner. And um, so congratulations on that. Uh, did, did you did you know when they were coming out and and pick it or did this? <laughs> I'm getting mixed messages here, but that's okay. But uh, you know your estimate of the 5,400 uh, deaths in Canada directly attributable uh, to to AMR, uh, the number in the U.S. if you include the C diff numbers uh, are about 48,000, and uh, if you if you compare our population in the United States to the Canadian population. Uh, if, if it's the same rate between the two countries, the 5,400 in your country comes out to 47,000 in the United States. Uh, so, you know, very different methodologies, but very similar rates. I mean, almost scarily similar rates to two reports that did not talk to each other and, uh, and happened to come out at the same time. 
And one thing I want to say is that this concept of a directly attributable death is key. If you notice that they talk about the number of people who died with a resistant infection, uh, the number of people who died because of a resistant infection, and then a smaller number directly attributable, okay? And this question of attributable mortality is, is, a, is a tough nut because a lot of the people that die with uh, drug-resistant infections have a lot of other things going on. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're having cancer and, and their immune system is suppressed and then the infection kills them. What goes on the death certificate is cancer frequently, right? Or pneumonia, not drug-resistant pneumonia or, or drug-resistant infection uh, that, that put them in the grave. So this idea of, of digging deeper and finding out how many are directly attributable is key. Uh, there is some open questions about how big the numbers are and whatnot, and the CDC has been uh, very meticulous in its methodology using electronic health records. Uh, Canada with a, a different methodology but coming out again with this narrower concept. I think it's good. We might still be underestimating the number, but we're not crying, you know, chicken little, the sky is falling. We're, we're showing with some detail, you know, careful methodology. I think that work on the methodology needs to be published and, 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 and you know, separately as a peer-reviewed paper. It needs to be worked up because it's important. Um, right now in Seattle, the folks that do the Global Burden of Disease uh, study are working on this issue for AMR. And so work like yours will be really helpful in, in that process. I also wonder if there's another way that Canada could lead because no one uh, to my knowledge, in a high-income country, is really putting this on the death certificates. Uh, there's been discussion about that in, in various settings, but uh, it's something, Sally, what do you think? I agree. It's really difficult. If you can do it, we'd all Yeah, it, it's something that Canada could lead on and, and the rest of the world would, would be in awe and would, would be forced to follow. Um, I think another thing that's really striking about this report is how AMR or drug resistant infections accentuate inequality. And, and to the extent that you care about that, you know, that it strikes the weakest first. And the social impact, I, I tweeted out the slide that was above your head just a moment ago. Your face is in, this, in the picture too. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's important to think about how the, the absence of untreatable, communicable infection makes civilization possible. Okay, if you think, if, uh, if, if the world's progress has been built on cities, urban communities, and that the biggest impediment to the development of cities over the last 10,000 years has been transmissible infectious disease, the, the availability of public health and the ability to otherwise prevent and then treat infectious disease, communicable infectious disease, has been key to the development of civilization, honestly. And, uh, and so some of that work ties into what you just said, and it's really a key thing. You know, it's not just a peripheral part really so much of what we consider a society uh, depends on that. Um, another comparative study, I, I took a look at uh, the rate of resistant bacterial infections in your report uh, per 1,000 population and compared it to the CDC report that came out. I had an advanced copy of the CDC report so I could do this work. And uh, your rate is about a third lower than the United States, so congratulations on that. Um, your uh, hospitals and infection control and prevention folks and maybe just in colder weather, bacteria multiply slower, uh, but you're well heated inside. Um, you know, you've done a good job, right? So your 5,400 deaths and all of that economic uh, disaster in the future is even in the context of having one third fewer uh, rate, lower rate of, of drug resistant infections than the United States of America with, with our system. Uh, the four pillars that you talked about of, of looking forward uh, are, are excellent surveillance and infection prevention and control, stewardship, research, and innovation. Um, what's missing in that list, though, but is in the global action plan, is education and outreach, informing the general public. And that is, of course, what we're doing today. And I know you've done a million interviews uh, on this. But I think that if we continue to talk only to experts, um, nothing uh, substantial will happen. I think one of Sally's great gifts is the ability to talk to people with money, and uh, like uh, the treasury or chancellor functions, as well as to the public. I'll concentrate the last of my comments on research and innovation. I, I work at, as the leader of CARBEX, it's the largest R&D organization for antibiotics in the world, it's nonprofit, funded in part by, the, by GAMRIF, by the United Kingdom government. 
Um, I think the call for focus is, is really thoughtful uh, on your innovation side. Uh, you, you called out alternatives and, 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 and both alternatives for human and also for agriculture and livestock in particular. The thing I would add to that list would be new classes of therapeutics because uh, some of your labs are doing that work and uh, that would be a game changer for the world. Uh, how would you get there? Um, well, I want to give a little ad for Boston. Boston has a, you know 4.6 million people in it. It's the number one hub in the world uh, for uh, a lot of things, but uh, that's, that's a Boston joke, sorry. The, uh, for biomedical innovation, for life science innovations, it has the largest amount of companies, the largest venture capital investment. For AMR innovation, it's also number one in the world uh, in terms of the preclinical companies working. Um, and, uh, but Canada has eight times the population of Boston, right? And you also have excellent universities. Um, what you need, I think, uh, is focus, particularly focus geographically, uh, because what Boston has is a network of people that are close together that you can have lunch or talk and walk. You can quit one job and not have to move your house and join something else that's going on. I would pick two or three or four geographic locations, focus within those locations, build the human capital, uh, and, uh, and then you'll have something spectacular uh, as a result of that. Um, I guess you can't give recommendations, but no one told me I can't, okay? Uh, the most stunning fact in the whole report, and somebody should tell me when I'm up for time, um, the most stunning thing was that $10 million a year is the federal funding for AMR. Uh, I, I thought, surely, somebody dropped a zero. It, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude too low. Uh, you know, that's less than $1,900 per death per year, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure Canadians are worth more than $2,000, right? Uh, per person. So it's a, it's a tremendous, and the upside potential is great, uh, the, and the funding is just incredibly too low. Um, Carvex has already funded some Canadian projects, the project I work on. Um, Eric's lab get, got some money through M MIT. Uh, we're hopeful for a lot of small innovative companies to come and, and get funds at Carvex, but uh, they need that, that, that push to get stuff out of the university and then assistance from the government uh, to get them ready for competition on the global scale. And uh, we're not seeing enough of that at present. I know we're gonna hear about phages in a little bit. I wanna say that uh, there's a bunch of phage projects underway at Carbex. Uh, they're not in public notice yet, but uh, you'll be seeing them coming. I'd love to, yeah. I, I, I didn't, I know you would be happy, but I didn't know you would be that happy, okay. And uh, I guess my time is up. I love the slide on, on the CDI vaccine, showing seven to $36 billion worth of savings. What I'm here to tell you though is that the economic case for a manufacturer of that vaccine is terrible. Uh, companies look at that and, and, and they look at what they could make selling it. Even though it has a tremendous social value, it has so little market value. And so we have to figure out ways to pay for the social value. And if Canada can do that, UK is trying to do that with, uh, with, uh, with the pilot program. If Canada could do that again, you'd set uh, a world record. So sorry for going over. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Next up is Andrew Morris. He's a professor of medicine, University of Toronto, medical director of Sinai Health Systems, university-wide university health network antimicrobial stewardship program. He's worked closely with regional, provincial, and federal governments and interprovincial organizations to help develop and coordinate antimicrobial stewardship efforts. And he's uh, the chair of many antimicrobial stewardship committees. So, Andrew, welcome. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be invited, and uh, thank you to uh, McMaster, Gardner Foundation, uh, Council of uh, Canadian Academies. I'm a member of none of those. You know, I think Groucho Marx says you'd never want to be a member of an, a club who'd accept you, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I almost always begin my talks on AMR discussing my own personal turning point. My own personal turning point uh, occurred just under 20 years ago, just down the road at Hamilton General Hospital. I was an attending physician there in infectious diseases, and, uh, and I tell the story often. I had a relatively young guy. He was a, a father, a husband. He had, a, he had brain surgery, and he had a complication of his surgery and a drug-resistant infection. Way back then, 
Uh, we didn't have even the tools that we have today to uh, treat um, drug-resistant uh, infections. And I had nothing to offer him. His organism just said resistant, resistant, resistant. I guess we needed uh, Dr. Strathy uh, around at the time. Um, and uh, all I could offer him was colistin, which I'd never used before. Colistin's basically a detergent, and it was really off the market because it was really uh, rather toxic. Uh, and he died. He died uh, either despite me or because of me. Um, and it was that afternoon when, after he died, I went to my colleague's office in the ICU, uh, a gentleman by the name of Peter Kraus, and I, I said, Peter, you know, uh, I need your help and we need to do something. And that really started my interest in antimicrobial resistance. When um, antibiotics fail is an outstanding report in all respects. It outlines um, antimicrobial resistance as a present day problem. It's not a future threat. I think that's one of the real important contributions I think it's gonna make for Canadians. And when we talk about crises, we talk about pressing contemporary important issues that require a civil society, a governmental, industrial, and a professional response. When we talk about epidemics, we talk about a spreading infectious diseases problem that requires a rather focused, coordinated response to contain or mitigate uh, the already experienced outcomes. And pandemics are really a larger extension of that. They're a larger scale, they require a larger scale response. And we've seen, People in this room have seen the epidemics and pandemics. We've seen Ebola and HIV, malaria, SARS, uh, TB. There's, the, the list is rather long. Antimicrobial resistance is all of those. It's a crisis. I think we can comfortably say, we should be saying now, it is a present day crisis. It's an epidemic and it's a pandemic. And I'm saying this without any desire for hyperbole whatsoever. As this report shows, and thankfully, I think a few other people here have juxtaposed it with the CDC's second report on the threat of antimicrobial resistance, the threat of AMR is growing at a remarkable rate. Um, it presently costs more lives than, as uh, Dr. Finley has already pointed out, the opioid crisis, and it's already affecting routine surgeries, safe women and infant labor and delivery, cancer care, transplantation, and I think what we've really failed in is the last point that uh, Dr. Outerson uh, just mentioned, which is not only uh, calling the problem what it is, which is a crisis, epidemic, and pandemic, but also articulating it and educating, it, educating the public in a manner that they can speak about it with the facility that they can talk about climate change or the opioid crisis. We've also failed in Canada to bring the public and its representatives especially the provincial, territorial, and federal governments, the payers for healthcare and all many of the other things that our society relies on, into the cognoscenti. We're the cognoscenti, or at least many of the people in the room here are the cognoscenti, but we need our elected officials to be the cognoscenti as well. I think they fail to understand the costs of AMR are being borne by all sectors of Canadian society, really all sectors, and as was just recently mentioned, that it's gonna be especially born in the more marginalized of our populations, and that includes in the service industry sector, which I think the report highlighted uh, brilliantly. I think the, um, our elected officials also don't recognize that the cost is, there's a cost in the lives, that's a substantial and should not be minimized co cost. What the report doesn't outline as much is the cost in terms of morbidity, which isn't just the lives lost, but the uh, disability from drug-resistant infections, and then the economic and financial costs, which are quite dramatic and are not only the GDP losses, but to individuals as well. And I think that probably what needs to occur, and civil society and our re representatives that are elected need to realize, is that time is of the essence. That's what bridges crises, epidemics, and pandemics, especially epidemics, is that time is of, the absent, uh, is of the essence. And so to change the AMR trajectory, we really start to, um, we require Canada to become a global leader in this effort. The past two US federal governments under Presidents Trump and Obama, each budgeted over about a billion dollars, well more than that, US in funding to combat AMR. And as the point was uh, made and is in the report, that our federal government has put 
I think it's more than 10 million, to be honest, when you put things together, but it's a magnitude uh, issue. And it's not even, we're really a rounding error uh, compared to what other uh, like-minded uh, economies around the world have been contributing to this. There have been consensus meetings, auditors general reports, a parliamentary standing committee on health or the HESA report and more. And all of these I think have fallen on deaf ears and I'm really hopeful that this report, which is quite outstanding and articulates the problem in a very clear manner, will not suffer a similar fate. I want to end by returning back to the patient that I talked about right at the beginning, the young man who's in the intensive care unit. And we failed him. And we failed him because we didn't have surveillance at the time to know that there was a problem. His drug-resistant infection almost certainly was something that at least partially was acquired um, from his, the hospital environment, and we had no idea because we didn't have the surveillance systems in place. On top of that, I remember he got exposed repeatedly to antibiotics, but there was no antimicrobial stewardship program in, that, in the hospital at the time. It actually started it. That's where I started my career in antimicrobial stewardship, was in that ICU in response to that patient. On top of that, the various infection prevention control measures that could have avoided his surgical site infection, um, they weren't to the level that we should be expecting and demanding for our patients. And whether it's in hospital and it's infection prevention control, or if it's in the greater society and it's more public health measures and the uh, social determinants of health factors, those uh, are necessary. And then on top of that, I was using an archaic antibiotic because we didn't have an antibiotic that we needed or some other antimicrobial to treat him. And so I think what, the, what my patient um, deserves and what I think this report highlights is that we have this opportunity. We have this opportunity. We have a, bur a, a burning platform right now. And we shouldn't let these deaths just um, be wasted, right? They, they should be honored. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next um, panel member is Joanne Dillon. So I've known Joanne forever. Um, she's um, very, very career. Um, but the most important thing is she was part of the panel. And so she lived the experience and um, what it was like to do and go through all these things. So she's currently head of the part of microbiology and immunology um, at the University of Saskatchewan, as well as a research scientist at the Vaccine and Infectious Diseases Organization. She's a fellow of both the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. And her area of specialty is sexually transmitted infections, and she certainly brought that to the panel and, you know, with public health and national and international institutions. So, Joanne, wherever you are, please come up. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much. It's a, a real honor to be able to speak here today. And uh, I want to thank my panel members for um, uh, the most wonderful experience and broadening experience seeing this multidisciplinarity address um, a topic that I've been concerned with throughout my entire career. I have always worked in uh, sexually transmissible infections with the emphasis on antimicrobial resistance and treatment options. I've worked in low, middle, and high-income countries. My job has been in high-income countries, but I've basically been involved in monitoring AMR and STIs around the world. One of the many things I appreciated about this report was the syndromic approach to the analysis of AMR because in fact, around the world, most patients are diagnosed with a syndromic approach to illness, and often without any knowledge whatsoever of the causative microorganism or even what its resistance is. So I think this report adds that dimension that makes it relatable uh, to countries that don't have a lot of diagnostic capability like we do, don't have access to some antimicrobials like we do, and actually have a hard time even diagnosing infections. I'm going to talk about the STI syndromes that uh, are addressed in the report. 
And you'll notice that we actually only address one microorganism. That's Neisseria gonorrhea. And that's because for most microorganisms that cause STIs, bacterial, there's actually no data on antimicrobial resistance. For example, syphilis is not mentioned in the report, but people, children are dying of congenital syphilis in this day and age. That should not happen. We don't mention mycoplasma genitalium in the report. It's an emerging STI, and do you know what? The prevalence of resistance in Canada to this is 10%. One of the people who did uh, Max Cherneski, one of the key studies, is sitting in the audience. We've been doing work in Saskatchewan. The prevalence of resistance is almost higher than what you find for Neisseria gonorrhea. The other thing about Neisseria gonorrhea, if you look at the stats with respect to the cost, is it looks very low. But we couldn't estimate the cost of the burden of disease of gonococcal infection. Most gonococcal infections are not diagnosed. They're asymptomatic. Although the rate of asymptomatic infections is even higher in women. What happens? Well, if a woman is untreated, she has a 20% chance of having very serious complications that are a tremendous cost to the healthcare system. Reproductive tract complications, ectopic pregnancy, and infertility. What is the cost of infertility? If we can't treat infections and people become infertile, which they do with STIs, what is the cost of that to future generations? The other thing is, is that before the antibiotic era, gonococcal eye infections were the leading cause of blindness in the world. What happens if we can't treat that? So there are a lot of costs associated with some of these syndromes that we couldn't even get at. The other thing I liked um, about this report was the social costs. And of course, STIs have huge stigma. If I sat here and said, oh, I've got gonorrhea, half of you would start squirming. Maybe all of you would start squirming. Right away, there's a stigma to this disease. And then you couple that with basically talking about age, sexual practices, uh, travel, uh, socioeconomic groups that are associated with this disease and possible antibiotic resistance, then you start to see this report in a nutshell, its impact, the people it's impacting. And in the case of STIs, it's young people, and it could be babies, and it could be mums, and it could be people who basically uh, lose a pregnancy because of an STI. The other tragic thing that I've seen throughout my career was the increasing resistance of gonorrhea to antibiotics. First it was penicillin, then it was tetracycline, then it was fluoroquinolones, then it was uh, macrolides, now it's third generation cephalosporins. Now we're trying combination therapy. No, 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 that's not working because one of the antibiotics we're using for combination therapy is resistant and that selects resistance in other microorganisms. So let's go back to really a high dose of the last antibiotic, the last bullet that we have for this disease. Already there are reports in Canada, UK, and elsewhere that the gonococcus is resistant. Some patients come and they're resistant to both antibiotics for treatment. There's a scramble. What are we going to treat with? How are we going to mitigate these infections? So far, we've been lucky, but there are very, very few antibiotics in the pipeline. So what do we have to do? Innovation. 
We need rapid diagnostics. We need rapid ways to diagnose AMR. We have to improve our surveillance and make it prospective, not retrospective, which is a huge problem with surveillance. We need better analytical methods. We need ways that are not retrospective to basically tell when there's an outbreak and to be able to match the genetic changes in the organism with treatment. So all of these elements were brought up in this report and that's why I found it so exciting because it linked a variety of syndromes with all the problems that we have to face. And so I think the real solution is through these mitigation strategies. And that will be very inventive, and I'm hoping that Canada can lead the way for some of those mitigations. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. So our last panelist, Dame Sally Davies, I need to reintroduce her because some people have joined on, on the um, podcast or the live cast. So she is the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance, and she was previously the Chief Medical Officer for England. And as you all know, she's taken a major worldwide role in combating AMR and promoting the whole issues about it. So welcome, Sally. Well, I've said it's a great report. And what fantastic interventions. So what are you all going to do? Because actually, how many of you are going to go home this evening and say, this is my job? That's what I did. That's what you all have to do. So if it's your job, what do you start with? I think you start with telling the story. And I love in the report that there are different ways of telling the story. I've learned that to politicians I tell one story, to the newspapers I tell another, to my colleague professionals I tell another. You need to frame it in different ways depending on the audience. I describe this problem as a jigsaw. None of us can sort a jigsaw. But we can, and you actually saw a slide because I talk about it as a jigsaw. My team said, let's make a jigsaw. You can each pick up one piece and say, this bit I can do. The problem generally in the world, and it happens for climate change, and it's happening here, because it's so complex, everyone will say, oh dear. And they go and have another cup of tea. At least we have tea in England. Instead of saying, oh shit, I can do that bit. And actually, that's what we've got to do. I sat there thinking, so if I were you, I'd go off with this and I'd go around every province and I'd talk to the payers and I'd say, here's what it's costing you. You can do something. You're going to feel so good when you do it too. So one of the secrets of making everyone else feel really good. You could give them the example of our incentivization payments and say, why don't you do this? You need the data. You need some targets. Can you do them federally? Can you do them um, provincially? But if you've got some data, then the power of transparency to the newspapers, the public is very important, ah, and to my profession. We are apt to be a bit competitive. Do we really like it when the doctor down the road is doing better? We've got masses of examples of registries and things like that where because people have seen where they are, particularly when their names are on it or their units are, they've improved. I think in your place, I'd be going around all the payers and showing them examples of what works and asking them, what are you going to do? You buy the service. You're responsible for the quality of it. It's on your doorstep, the deaths, the morbidity, the cost. You could make a difference. Let me help you make a difference. I'd be talking to philanthropists. Um, I should know her name. There's a wonderful woman in um, Alberta who's done a terrific amount around brain development and children's development. You need someone like that who helps on the social sciences and thinking about it. So 
I think you should all go home and think, what's the bit I can do and take responsibility because you've got such a great report? It's difficult if you don't have some data and something to talk about. But this gives you that. I'm going to use it in Britain and around the world, so you ought to use it. And thank you for doing it. Thank you so much, Sally. So if I could call the four panelists up here. Um, so the plan is we're going to have a Q&A for the next little bit here. Um, so you guys would join me up here. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've heard it all. Um, got different opinions here. So I think um, we will open it up for discussions. But maybe before we do that, I'm actually going to ask the panel something, because it's something I've struggled with over the last 36 hours, is that as I've been fielding all the media reports, the question comes, well, what can the average person do? What can I do as, what can, you know, not, not scientists, but you just you as a person? So how do we answer that? I mean, I use the usual. You like, mean apart from washing your hands? Yeah, you tell them that. Don't use antibiotics in your, in your, in your counter-cleaning soap. And, um, those kind of things, and, you know, it, and I think this, this builds what you said, Sally, that, you know, everyone can do something, and people, when they hear this, they want to do something. What can I do now? So what do I tell those people? What do you tell those people? You want to take a stab at that? I'll start. So I think uh, team uh, Sally has uh, led it off perfectly by saying washing your hands, getting vaccinated, you know, having a healthy lifestyle, best ways to Great. Anyone else want to add into that? Yeah. I'll say something about uh, advocacy as well. Uh, there's a couple of websites now that are taking, uh, allowing people to give one minute videos of their personal stories about AMR. And uh, one of them is called Working to Fight AMR, which is, uh, is also abbreviated WTF AMR. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's another one that uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America is doing. And these are powerful little short videos, and what, what the, the group is doing then is that it automatically sends them to the member of Congress, depending on where you live. So the, the, something like that for Canada, because yeah, the idea. personal stories are powerful. Um, you know, the second thing is that your personal purchasing power is powerful. Uh, in the United States, for four decades, I think, people tried to get the FDA to, to pass regulations about restrictions on animal use of antibiotics, it went nowhere for political reasons. As soon as people started not buying food or, or changing their purchasing patterns based on whether the chicken was antibiotic free or not, uh, Walmart and McDonald's uh, you know, jumped into the fray. And there's a report that comes out every year now in the US, it just came out, and uh, you know, certain restaurants did really well, certain restaurants did terribly. And the hope is that that consumer power will do a lot more than government regulations ever could. I didn't see Tim Hortons on the, uh, on the <laughs> list. Uh, I think it was just U.S. So you need a Canadian version of that report. Yeah, good. Drive consumer spending. Money talks. Okay, I think we'd like to open up. And there's Eric here. Kevin, you talked about Boston as being a, a hub of uh, innovation and technology, et cetera in the biomedical sciences and, and um, implored us to kind of get, get going on, uh, on the AMR problem. But the truth is, of course, that all of the companies in Boston that are dealing with AMR are struggling terribly uh, for, uh, for venture funding, for, uh, you know, for prospects to move something preclinically into the clinic. It's just it's a really devastating problem. I know that you know a lot about this. Um, yeah, this is... Where, where do you see this going, and, and is there a solution in sight? Thank you. So uh, th one of the reasons why Sally has to leave in a, in a few minutes is because she's going to go off and solve this problem for us. <laughs> um, you know, I am, I am optimistic because uh, the market is broken, but governments now see that. 
you know, 10 years ago it was some, a couple of academics who had understood that. Now you hear it from the administrator of Medicare, from the head of US HHS. You hear it in G7 reports, here in G20, you know. And, uh, and it's understood both from the government side and at the top levels of, of private industry. Uh, getting to a solution of actually cutting money takes work. But, um, but people clearly see the problem and understand it together at this point. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, but um, I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years we will have a market solution to what's happened with the antibiotic companies. Okay, there's a question over there, Monica. Oh, I'm sorry. Next. Thank you. Uh, I've also looked, there's a lot of effort being made in new uh, ways to get this res uh, solve the resistance, but there's so much that can be done on prevention within hospitals, within areas. So there's lots of numbers. There's a new standard coming out from CSA on cleaning and disinfecting, but trying to get hospitals to invest in that because it's prevention, not another pill they can write a prescription for. How do we get that point across and how much prevention of transmission within hospitals can help? Who wants to talk a lot? I can, I yeah, Andrew should do it. Yeah. I can take a side of that. I think you're um, probably more cynical than I think the, the reality of which portrays. I think most uh, hospital leaders understand the importance and the cost of antimicrobial resistance and hospital acquired infections to the patients and therefore to the hospital. And I'm not talking about the cost of the dollar cost, I'm talking about the morbidity and mortality. And I can tell you, I was just at a meeting yesterday and the uh, direction from the CEO of the hospital was banned. Importance about prevention. Okay, there's a question up here. Thank you. You're doing a lot of running back and forth. Good fitness. Rainer Engelhardt here. Look, we've touched on the insurance, uh, sorry, we've touched on industry being a potential ally, whether it's the investment industry or the we'd like to have, or the pharmaceutical industry. But I wonder what your thoughts might be about invoking the power of the medical insurance industry in this. Well, I think all of these are important. Um, and in fact, I've done quite a lot of presentations in the city of London to investors, investors in the food chain, investors in the health industry, um, and also to actuaries who do insurance. So I, I actually have really left my comfort zone of being a haematologist behind because I think all of these people in different ways can impact. I believe investment and consumers between them can beat the rest of us at our job if we really persuade them. So I'm with you and I have talked to a number. Joanne, did you want to comment on the hospital question previously? Well, I'm just saying in terms of um, infection control, um, Hospitals are, are actually improving uh, according to the statistics, but there was a recent report about a huge gap. And that deals with our aging population that uh, this, this issue is going to affect. And more and more um, of us are going to end up uh, living in care homes, uh, various facilities and so forth. And there's almost no oversight on, on uh, this dimension and, and that type of facility. And I think maybe that's one of the gaps in the report that we didn't address and where um, that kind of um, initiative would be very welcome. So I'm just wondering how hospitals might be able to extend their linkages actually for training and so forth for personnel in uh, places uh, where elderly, infirm people uh, and other people 
actually are living these days. Can I pick up on that? Of course. So I absolutely agree. Um, and that takes us into diagnostics. So of course we want better diagnostics. Has the patient got something that needs antibiotics? And if so, which is it? Do you want? And it's the resistance. But diagnostics, badly used, can, can be difficult. So in old age homes, we discovered that they were all using dipsticks and saying, oh dear, white cells onto antibiotics. So we have a big program to dip or not to dip. <laughs> and um, in the uh, old uh, age homes where this program is happening, antibiotic use has gone down and there's no evidence of deterioration in health of the elderly people living there. So we've got to think through as well, what are we doing at the moment and is it harmful? This is more specifically a question for, for Dame Sally. What have been the tipping points in the progression of AMR discussion in the UK, because it's been quite impressive. I guess it was two prime ministers ago now, but you know, it, people were regularly talking about medicine being cast into the dark ages and quotes like that. And I'm sort of curious as to what the trajectory was to getting to the point where you have this kind of public discourse and you have this, these public ad campaigns. Um, prime ministers find it difficult to say no to me when I go and see them. <laughs> I start at the top. There you go. That's what you do. <laughs> we'll get on it, Eric. Uh, Dave, Dave Rowling. Hi. Oh, jeez. Uh, this is David Rowling. Um, really enjoyed your discussion. I just downloaded the report and just read all 268 pages. It's Good. fantastic. Um, <laughs> I know that solutions need to start at home, um, but I'm particularly persuaded these days that your country has unusual leadership uh, capabilities and potential worldwide. All of the discussion so far is really focused around the developed world. What are your thoughts about how Canada might lead in discussion in those parts of the world where huge amounts of drugs are used, the developing world, and yet the resources that are available to combat the issue are, are so few? Who wants to tackle global inequity? So I'll, I'll say something and then see if other people will jump in. Uh, every uh, project that goes through CARBEX that we fund, we, we do a, an official developmental assistance uh, evaluation to see how it would impact the low and middle income countries of the world. And, uh, and then some of those that have, that go through, have a positive result on that actually get additional funding uh, that comes from the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the th interesting things about that process is that it's become really clear that a product that's important in the high income world, it's actually most of the time, a lot more important you know, in the low-income world. And so we're beginning to think about and, and get the companies to think about years before they ever would have done so previously, uh, you know, how they would address access and stewardship uh, outside of the, of the high-income countries. A salient example is that a company called Intasis uh, in, in Boston has a, has a gonorrhea drug that's in phase three trials. Uh, they had no plans to, to be able to distribute it. It's a small company with about 50 people. They were gonna, they were gonna try to sell in the US and, and five countries in Europe and that was gonna be their market. It's a very small company. What do they do with the rest of the world? And so um, Guard P, which is uh, stood up out of the uh, World Health Organization based in Geneva and DNDI, uh, took a license from Intasis, from this company, for the, I think, 166 poorer countries of the world, leaving 34 to the company. Right? And so GARP is going to take the responsibility for, for that part of the equation. They're a nonprofit. They're focused on a global health mission. And, and the company is going to take the, the high income world. And they're working together to fund the phase three trial. A beautiful example. And that model is used a lot by the Gate Foundation, too, for many of their projects. Yeah. Same well, idea. We're funding them, too. You're funding them as well. I mean, there's a lot of, right. <laughs> the German government also funds that project. I think they're the largest. Uh, for these discussions. Uh, I guess my question is regarding the part that's not covered by the uh, report. You know, it says very clearly that the mandate did not include environmental 
uh, issues. Agriculture. So, uh, and agriculture. So uh, just in terms of uh, the, uh, you know, the public health folks are sitting here, the CIHR folks are sitting here. We've been working for 18 months on putting together the Pan-Canadian Action Plan. Uh, what would be sort of your guidance of where we should look for in terms of engaging that sector and getting some more data to include into our considerations? So it does go back to surveillance and data, doesn't it, to start with? You want to know what's going on in your environment, your water table, your various industries, uh, what's coming out of your farming for the food chain and your hospitals um, and your people generally. So that's kind of data, but the, the other sort of data is... I don't know whether you have intensive food farming, but are they using antibiotics appropriately? There are all sorts of world benchmarks you can compare against. We've got a lot of them. How's your fish farming doing? You know, start with some data and uh, an exchange of information and then move to what you need to do and develop. But IDRC would clearly be able to help you, and they are Canadian and they know the animal and aquatic area reasonably well. Yeah, we struggled with this, the panel, because we had three veterinary people, if you want to call them that, on it. And where did we draw the line? Because it, it really was an arbitrary line. You, you know, we, we just drew it here kind of thing. Um, but I, I think, as I said before, on, on, a, on a much better note, we even no longer use antibiotics as growth supplements in agriculture. And my, one of my hobbies is beekeeping, and they used to just dump antibiotics in all the time. And you, you now have to get a vet to get a, you a prescription to use this antibiotics. They don't teach beekeeping in vet school, so this is really rather comical when you approach a vet and, well, you know, where's the cow kind of thing? No, it's, it's a beehive. Um, so they're struggling with adjusting. But, but all that being said, I think it's, um, there's a lot of movement on that area. I think they're well aware of the issues there, and I'm sure there's a lot of those numbers there too. Yeah, other, the back there. Hi. So it was mentioned that um, uh, our resistance rates here in Canada are less than our neighbors down south. south. So we must be doing something right. What is it that we're doing different? What is it that we're doing right that is, that's decreasing the resistance rates? I don't know if it's right, but it's a different model system. Um, you know, we, we have a more social um, health care system. Yeah. It's based on the province, not individual units. And my guess is in the States, some of the privately run hospitals have incredibly low rates, and others might not be quite so good. So it's, I think it's a mixed bag there. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think the numbers show we're we may be slightly less, but I'm not sure. I mean, the countries are very similar in this area. Um, we do have more, you know, government agencies looking at this, I think, and more so. But I don't think we can hold our laurels up. I mean, the numbers, as we heard, the numbers are pretty similar, and the societies are pretty similar. And we can both do better, both countries. So, Other questions? Down here. So the goal here is as soon as the mic gets to there, make sure you're over there when you ask the next question, right? <laughs> uh, so there was the mention earlier, the, the CDI vaccine, that, you know, highly effective, but really no market, right? The financial situation was not good. So the populace has been used to accessible and affordable antibiotics for a very long time. How much do we have to work on that game just to make the populace understand that antibiotics and vaccines can't be cheap anymore? That, while we're willing now to spend an anti-cancer drug, a, a phenomenal amount of money to extend life a little bit, we're not willing to spend a lot on antibiotic to save a life. How, uh, the UK example, has that, how much has that been by at all that medicine might have to get more expensive because we're in crisis? Well, we've played that out in Britain, but people don't buy their own antibiotics unless they're the rare cr rich creatures in the private sector. We have a social health care system so again, it was down to the payers. You are going to have to pay more, because if you pay more now up front, it'll be cheaper than picking up the bits at the end. So it's back to an economic argument. And that's why part of the way I persuaded the chief exec of the NHS to do this pilot that we're doing, because um, I got him into my office and discussed that, among other things. I did tell him he'd look like a saint. and. And wouldn't it be wonderful for him to look like a saint among the world? If I, if I could uh, just touch on that also. I think Canada, like it, in many other jurisdictions in the world, um, our emotional attachment with antimicrobials is unique. Right? Um, most children in childhood 
receive at least one course of an antimicrobial. Their communication that they receive from their parents or guardians is, uh, you need to take this. If you don't take this and finish it up, you won't get better and you're gonna get sick or worse. And, and it's also extremely accessible. Most people don't have the access to cancer drugs like they do to antimicrobials. And certainly nobody has an emotional attachment to like aspirin or a cholesterol lowering drug like they do to antibiotics. And that creates a, a really fascinating um, uh, culture around antibiotics. And so, uh, you know, I don't, pre I don't prescribe cancer drugs. I have my colleagues who know about cancer, our oncologists, to prescribe the cancer drugs or to guide me. But everyone and their brother, sister, mom, dad, dog, cat, <laughs> feel very comfortable prescribing an antibiotic even though they have close to zero expertise on that. And until we start changing that conversation too and treat it as a really valuable resource, we're gonna be stuck with the problem that we're existing ar around the value of antibiotics because we don't treat it like it's valuable. We treat it like it's rather disposable. Hearing you say dog and cat, uh, you know, there are some interesting studies on the amount of companion animal yep. antibiotics yeah. that are given in the U.S. And then the more interesting studies are tracking the horizontal shift of, of resistant Absolutely. You know, plasmids within the family unit from yep. Fido Absolutely. Or, yeah. or the world's cutest cat. Okay, on that pet note, I think we're going to wrap this up here. I want to thank the panelists very much for all their time. Thank you, you. Thank you, Gardner. Thank you, everyone. And as Sally said, go do something. Thank you very much. Take a risk. Probably they're afraid of